Welcome everyone to Chicago Football Connection Podcast. I am your host, Steve Letizia. You can follow me on Twitter at CFC Bears. Uh, it's been a rough week for me. I was excited to go to more Bears training camps, put more videos out for everyone, uh, but then I caught COVID. Um, so I've been quarantined, I've been sick. I wanted to get this video out on Wednesday, but I just couldn't do it. Um, so I look like shit, I sound like shit, but I'm going to power through and try and get this video out here. I'm also going to try and do another video this weekend because I'm going to be quarantining anyway not going anywhere, so I'll have plenty of time to get that done, um, so hopefully I can do that as well. Uh, but bear with me while I, I, I recover. Uh, like I said, I sound a, little, sound a little rough, but I'm feeling a lot better now. Um, I think I'm on the up and up. So uh, for this video I'm going to do, it's a little, little late. I uh, wanted to have this earlier, like I said, uh, but it, the M Michael Schofield and Riley Reef breakdown, um, so I watched the All-22 of, of both those guys from the last couple of years. Um, so I'm going to break down their film, what I like about them, what I don't like about them, how I think they can uh, fare in 2022 um, in the Bears scheme. Um, Schofield um, coming from a, a pretty different scheme than uh, the Chargers ran a pretty different scheme than what the Bears are going to run, uh, whereas the Bengals actually ran a, a somewhat similar scheme, at least in their run game. Uh, so I'm going to talk about both those guys. Um, I'm going to start with Michael Schofield because he was signed first, um, and then we'll move on to Riley Reef. Um, so let's jump right into it. All right, so before I even looked at the L22 of Michael Schofield, I loved the signing. Uh, we needed a right guard. Before the signing, it was looking like it was going to be either Ja'Tyre Carter, who was a rookie, sixth-round pick, um, or Sam Mustafer, um, who I think is better suited at center, and a lot of people don't even think he should be on the roster. Um, so they had a huge hole there, and I like Ja'Tyre Carter a lot. I think he's looked good in training camp. I think he has a bright future, um, at least as you know, maybe a solid starter down the line. But... That's a big jump going from, from a historically black college university to the NFL uh, level, a week one starter. So that's a huge jump for a young guy to make. I'd rather have him learn from a veteran. Um, so even before I watched any Michael Schofield, I was a really big fan of the signing, just um, as a position of need. You could argue right guard was the biggest position of need for the Bears. Um, and they at least signed someone who has um, some experience there. 102 games played, 81 starts. A majority of those starts coming at right guard. He did play some tackle uh, from time to time and left guard, uh, but he was always played his best at right guard. Uh, I know PFF grades can be a little uh, eh here and there. Um, their stats are a lot better than their grades, but um, just looking at his grades, he's always graded out better at right guard than he has at tackle or left guard. Um, so I think that's exactly where he's going to play with the Bears. Um, and then once I started digging into him a little bit more, um, I liked signing even more uh, because I think he still has a lot left in the tank. Um, you know, he's only 30 years old, um, 30, 31, something like that. He's not too old. Um, um, so I think he still brings a lot to the table for the Bears. I think he's going to be a really solid stopgap for them. Um, if not, I could even see it possible that they, after this year, um, sign him to an extension as well if he plays well. Uh, and the contract they got for him, I think, is a vet minimum contract. Um, is really a steal for a player of Michael Schofield's caliber. Um, he's not going to be um, an all-pro or even a pro bowler, most likely, uh, but he is going to solidify that right guard spot and make it a lot easier um, uh, for the guys around him to, to, to function because as on the offensive line we've seen in the past, you're only as strong as your weakest link, um, and now they've, they've made it so that they don't have a weak link at right guard, at least. Uh, we'll see how the rest of the offensive line plays out. Uh, but at least they got a solid guy here. Uh, to start the season. Uh, so let's look a little bit at his stats. Um, so this is again from PFF. So this is out of 46 qualifying guards. Uh, pass block grade, I know, take these grades with a caveat. Um, I'm a big PFF supporter, but even I realize that these grades can sometimes be misleading. But it's just a one data point um, in all of these data points that we have. So I still like to use them. Um, so pass block grade, 75.2. Um, seventh among those 46 qualifying guards. So obviously a very good pass blocker. Only gave up two sacks. Uh, which was ninth, um, QB hits, hurries, pressures around, uh, you know, 15th, um, uh, middle of the pack pretty much there. Um, the pass block efficiency and pressure rate, that's where you really, you get better data, uh, because Schofield did play less snaps than a lot of these guards, so these counting stats, um, can be a middle, little misleading. Uh, but the pass block efficiency, 97.7, that's 14th out of all the 46 qualifying guards. Pressure rate of 4.26, that's 20th. Um, and then the TPS pressure rate is true pass sets. Uh, so true pass sets, if you're not familiar, 
or pass sets that um, you're one on one with your guy. There's no play action. There's no uh, running back or tight end chipping. Uh, they also take out any quick passes like screens. Um, so anything at less than two seconds to throw, they take out. Um, so it really gives a good barometer of of how a guy performs in one on one situations. Um, and he was even better in, at his pressure right there. He went from jumped from twentieth all the way up to eighteenth. Um, so anyway, you slice that. I think he's kind of in that in terms of a pass blocking guard. He's in that you know fifteen to twenty five range um, in terms of pass blocking, which is you know a, a, a very very clearly a um, a starting right guard or starting guard in this league. Um, so the stats were encouraging, um, at least from a pass blocking standpoint. Um, so now let's get into now that we have the numbers, let's get into um, some of the things I saw that I liked about him. Um, so this is a rep here. Let me pause this. So again, is that right guard going against the Raiders? Uh, we'll just play this. But you'll see how he uses his length really well. You can see that um, jab right there. I paused it right at the right time. Um, he uses he has 34-inch arms, and he uses them very effectively. So he uses that to kind of punch the guy to keep him off balance. You also really like how, he, how wide his base is. Um, so you can see how far apart his feet are. Uh, makes a, um, it gives him more better leverage uh, in both the pass blocking and run blocking game. But you also see how the this rep is really showing how he resets his hands. And you can kind of see it better from the other angle, but you need both angles to kind of get the full picture. Um, so you get that initial punch, um, and the defender kind of uh, swats away his arms, but he's still able to, to win the reps. And you can see it, again, you can see it a little bit better from this other angle. Um, so, again, here we're watching how he resets his hands. Um, so, he, again, he gets that punch. But you can see the defender number 97, I don't know his name, but he gets his arm, his hand on the shoulder pad, on the inside shoulder pad of the of, of Schofield, uh, which is not what what you want out of an offensive lineman, but he's able to to uh, get his hands off him and then reset and then get his hands back underneath the defender's shoulder pads um, so he can create, get leverage um, and get that grip strength on him uh, and prevent him from, from um, doing anything in, in the passing game. So that's just one example. This is another, uh, probably a better example, but honestly, I probably should have led with this one. Uh, but again, right guard going against the Broncos this time. But you can see he has, again, that initial punch um, to keep the defender off balance. That's very, uh, that's some, that's very common when watching him. Um, he's very good at landing that first punch. It's a little high here. It's up on the face mask. Uh, but I think he gets a little bit of the defender's arm, which kind of pushes his hands up. Uh, but he's very quick um, and strong and, and, has good, um, and has good hand placement with, with that punch, too. He lands it exactly where, usually where it needs to be. But then again, you can see... Need a new video player. How the defender then gets readjusts, gets his hands on him, but then he's able to readjust again, get his hands, you can see right there, underneath his shoulder pads, and then that grip strength and the wide base um, allows him to just completely nullify the rush from the defender. So we're just gonna watch that one again at full speed, so you can watch, I won't pause it this time. But you can see how he how he gets he consistently gets those hands underneath the pads of the defender. Um, and consistently is able to get the hands off his chest um, to do so. So this is another good rep. This is a, he's a really good hand fighter. Um, you know, a, a few years ago, I forget which coach I was on here because we have so many, but someone, well, it might have been even Matt Nagy, brought in a, um, a karate guy or something to, uh, to teach hand fighting to the offensive lineman. Um, because it is so important that, but he's a really good hand fighter. He's really good with his hands. Um, so again, gets that punch, and then just uses his length um, to keep the defender off of him. You can see it like, a little better from this other angle, where he's constantly readjusting his hands, constantly getting um, the defender's hands off of him uh, to make sure that they can't control the point of attack. And again, watch his footwork too, because you can see um, the wide base that he has consistently. Look how far away his feet are. Um, you can even say maybe that's a little bit too wide. Uh, but it, that also allows him to move well laterally as well, that wide base. So not only does it give him a good anchor, uh, it allows him to move well laterally if he, laterally if he needs to uh, to keep up with, with, um, 
with the defender. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and then, just again, I mentioned his length. He's very good at using his length to his, to his advantage. 34 inch arms, that's tackle length playing inside a guard. Um, there are tackles with, you know, 33 inch arms, uh, but he measured it at 34 inches. Right, so we can track that. And the hand placement, too, is something I mentioned. Right. You can where see exactly where he lands. His hands here. Right. So we... He's got it on the, uh, the, uh, the collar of this defender. That defender's not going anywhere that. with his grip strength. Um, quick question. Here's what another example. Same, same game. Creative contact. Just using his uh, length really well. Not letting the defender get into his body. We see that a lot question. with you know, other bears, what often with linemen, um, who are maybe late with their hands. Or, or just don't have long arms. Um, I talked about that a little bit with in my offensive line breakdown. Um, or, uh, I'm going to post to that as well. I, I was going to mention that in my introduction, the, my offensive line breakdown. Um, after I did that offensive line breakdown, the Bears signed two offensive linemen, and who knows what's going on with Tevin Jenkins. So, um, <clears throat> But I talked a lot, that, a lot about that, especially with Tevin Jenkins, because he did have shorter arms, about how sometimes he struggled with, with keeping guys off his body. That's not something that Michael Schofield struggles um, with. Um, usually. Now I think uh, one more example here of uh, just using his line. I think there was like close to five hundred thousand off balance. Um, these are just some good examples of, of as I mentioned before, um, his hand placement. Um, so this is from uh, years ago. This is against the. This is when he was on Denver. So this is either his uh, rookie year or his second year in the league. Uh, but I just thought it was a very good example. Of his hand placement and his, his strong hands. So you can see how he, it's hard, sometimes hard to tell, but he gets his hands fully extended, arms fully extended, hands underneath the shoulder pads um, of the defender, um, and is able to um, completely nullify the pass rush. Here's another example. This is from, this is just from last year. But you can see how he gets his hands on the shoulder pads again, uses the length well, and the defender is unable to do anything. Same thing there. Um, so it's not a coincidence, he's aiming for the same spot each time. Um, that one's a little bit different, but these last two, you can see he aims for the exact same spot. You saw it in a, in a rep um, before, too, um, to get that hand inside the shoulder pads um, and get that grip strength going and, and preventing them from, from doing anything. <clears throat> the other nice thing about his length is it gives him the ability to recover if beaten. Um, and as you can see from his, his stats, you know, he's not a perfect guard. He's going to get beat from time to time. Every offensive lineman gets beat. Uh, and that's the thing about offensive linemen. You, you don't usually notice them as a fan until they're getting beat. You don't notice all the, the 15 good reps before that one bad one. Uh, but with Schofield, he's able, um, because he has such great length and great athleticism, um, he's able to recover pretty, pretty well if he is beat. Um, so we can watch that one again. So again, right guard there. Um, he doesn't land his initial punch like he usually does, and the defender's able to swat his hands away um, and get around him. So normally this would lead to a sack, uh, but because of his athleticism and his length, he's able to push him out of the way um, and allow the quarterback to step up in the pocket. Um, so the way he doesn't give up on when he has beat, um, that stood out a few times, um, and that length is just, is just really nice to have on the interior. You don't see a lot of guards with 34-inch arms, um, so that's, that, that was really nice to see. So then, when I, I was at training camp this, uh, last week, and I'm hoping to get to training camp again um, sometime in the future, uh, but he was, um, on the first day I went there, which was Friday, uh, which is when I caught COVID, so shout out to whoever gave me COVID. Um, uh, he, I had a very good view of the offensive line and defensive line drills, so the one-on-one -on -one drills, and um, so that's obviously a pass blocking drill, um, and it typically favors defenders because it's one-on-one, -on -one, um, and Defenders usually win, defensive linemen on offensive linemen on one ones usually win those reps. You don't have help from running backs or tight ends. You don't have help from a center coming over and double teaming. Just one on one. Um, and I'd say the most impressive guy in those reps was Michael Schofield. Um, he looked really good. Um, a lot of things I saw with the wide base, uh, the length, the hand placement, the, the strong punch, all that stuff showed up um, in practice, in drills. Um, and I just have one one uh, video here that I took. Uh, yeah, this is against Angelo Black. So he tries to do a little spin. Uh, obviously, it doesn't work. It's shut down. So you can see the wide base. Punch the hand placement. Uh, 
the resetting of everything there, um, that leads me to believe that he's going to be successful um, as a pass blocker, at least, in this scheme. Um, so that was really nice to see, um, especially since he kind of came in a little bit cold, you know, signed off the street. I'm sure he was, you know, keeping active and everything. Uh, but the fact that he's able to just come in right away and, and still look like a, a very good pass blocker was good to see. Uh, run blocking, I'm going to talk a little bit about next. I'm kind of going, going fast through this because um, I want to make sure I have time to get... I, I don't want to do another two-hour podcast. That was way too long. Um, but run blocking with, with Schofield, um, he's clearly a better pass blocker than run blocker. Um, there's, no, there's no question about that. Uh, I, I, not, I don't have his PFF grades and stuff and all that in, information for run blocking. Uh, because I feel that it was a, a good indicator of him as a talent. Because, um, as I mentioned before, the Chargers ran a very different scheme than what the, what the Bears will be running. Uh, the Chargers ran a, a very heavy gap man scheme, um, and the Bears will be running a very heavy outside zone scheme. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that, um, that the Chargers did not uh, run outside zone. They did. Um, and that doesn't mean that the Bears will not be running gap power. They will. Um, no matter what scheme you run, you're going to be running inside zone, outside zone, power, power or gap, whatever you want to call it. Um, you'll be running all of those, um, no matter what scheme you run. It's just, you know, Bears are going to be running more outside zone, where the Chargers ran more gap power. Um, uh, but I did, uh, so I did find that um, when I'm watching him on the Chargers, that when they, when they did run outside zone, he did look, you know, adequate at least uh, in the run game, whereas when they did run gap power, he looked very much like a below-average run blocking offensive lineman, um, and I think he falls somewhere in between there. Uh, he's probably still overall a little bit below average as a run blocker, uh, but he's not going to be kill you, um, especially with, with, with the Bears running majority of outside zone and, and probably inside zone second, and then a few more gap uh, and power uh, uh, run schemes when maybe in the red zone or, or in short yardage situations. So I have a few examples here. Um, let me pause this for a second. Okay, so here I have two outside zone plays from when Schofield was on the Chargers. This first one is him blocking from the backside, and the next one is him blocking from the front side. Again, they didn't run a whole, a whole lot of outside zone, uh, but I was able to find at least a few examples. And these are two examples where I think he did a really good job. Um, and he is better when he's on the move rather than trying to overpower the guy in front of him. Um, so this is going to be uh, just outside zone, so we have Schofield at right guard here. Um, so he actually has a pretty easy job here. He's going to block down on this uh, three-technique defensive tackle before getting up to the second level. So he's going to pass this three-technique over to the right tackle, and we're running the outside zone this way. Uh, the running back... Uh, let me clear this. So on the other side of the ball... The center is going to try and get to the outside shoulder of this nose tackle, and the left guard is going to block him and then move up to the second level. However, that's not exactly what happens. Uh, the center is not able to get to the outside um, shoulder of the nose tackle, so instead of getting to the outside shoulder of the nose tackle, he's going to just go to, he's going to um, pivot and, and get to the inside shoulder and, and just try and block him out of the play, which creates a cutback lane uh, for the running back. Um, so it's kind of something that was changed on the fly there. Uh, just based on the alignment of the defense and, and how the offensive line was able to block. Um, so that's what's happening over there. But Schofield does a really nice job of blocking down onto this the three technique and then getting to the second level. And watch his hips as well, the way he's able to... I probably didn't need to circle that there. Uh, the way he's able to flip his hips is really nice here and, and create a seal for the, run, uh, for the running back, even if the running back gets tackled uh, before he can actually get to the running lane that Schofield creates. So here, you can see... Um, he engages a three technique, passes his him on to the to the uh, uh, that'd be the right tackle, um, and you can see the running lane here for the running back that Schofield creates the running lane right off his um, his um, outside hip. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the the back side, the front side, uh, or or play side off, so I didn't do their job quite as effectively. So he's gonna get tackled here, but you can see how much lane, how much room um, Schofield was able to create. Uh, with his running lane, and he is able to get to the second level. But again, um, back it up even farther. Watch his hip, how he's able to flip his hips there, and create that running lane. Uh, so his movement skills uh, are obviously very good. 
we look at his, I didn't show this earlier, I forgot to, but if we look at his, um, his uh, relative athletic score, you can see, um, you know, a little bit undersized, maybe not as explosive, but he has really good agility, agility and speed drills. And that always shows up when he's blocking on the move like this in these outside zone schemes or outside zone plays. Okay, so that was um, him blocking backside on uh, outside zone rush. Here we're going to look at him blocking to the play side. So the running, the running the ball to the right. Uh, we're obviously looking at the right guard, Michael Schofield. So his job on this play is to get to this outside shoulder of the, uh, of the three technique here. Uh, the right tackle is going to help him out by blocking, um, chip block, basically chip blocking the right tackle before moving on to the second level. Uh, so with that, that double team, it's going to allow Michael Schofield to overtake um, the outside shoulder of, that, of that, um, that three technique. Now we saw on the previous play, um, when I was talking about the center, um, whose job was it to get to the outside shoulder of, in that case it was a nose tackle, in this case Schofield's getting to the outside shoulder of the three technique, uh, but it's the same distance traveled. So the center in that case, in the last play, was not able to get to the outside shoulder of that nose tackle, and instead he had to pivot um, and push him out of the way from his inside shoulder, which created an early cutback on the on the outside zone, uh, which allowed the the linebackers to to make a play on the ball. Um, so it's not a difficult, it's not an easy block uh, for um, for an offensive lineman to make. But you can see Schofield does a good job of doing just that. So he's able to get to the outside sh outside shoulder. Uh, once he has that outside shoulder, you can see his hand placement, um, really good strong hands there. Uh, but then the right tackle is able to get to the second level. Uh, but you can see he's able to get in between the ball and the defender, uh, which creates that lane. Now the rest of the offensive line, I'm not sure what they doesn't block great, uh, but the play does go where it's supposed to. You don't get that early cutback lane that we got on the other one, which which leads to just the linebackers being in a better position um, to make a play on the ball. Um, but you can see just the way he's able to flip his hips, the athleticism, the lateral agility, uh, really shows. We saw his, um, you know, his RAS scores, the agility scores, the speed scores. That shows up in his run blocking. He's much better when he's blocking on the move um, than he is with power. Um, and that showed up um, a lot when watching him. All right, so that's all the good stuff. Um, obviously, there's no such thing as a perfect player. Uh, it'd be unfair of me to just show you all the good plays of Michael Schofield and ignore all the weaknesses. Um, if you do that, you can make any player in the NFL look good. Um, <clears throat> So let's go to some of the bad stuff. Let's start with the pass blocking. Um, as I mentioned before, he's a very technically sound player, very good with his hands. Um, oops. Very good with his hands. Uh, the problem is, you know, if he's if he doesn't land that initial punch that we showed, we, we I showed you that earlier with his length and his 34 inch arms. If he doesn't land that initial punch, or if he's late with his hands, uh, defenders are able to overpower him or swat his hands away. Um, so the timing is very important. Uh, with Schofield, he's got to win very. He's got he has to win early in the rep, and if he doesn't win early in the rep, it's going to be tough for him to 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 overpower uh, these bigger defenders. Um, and that's exactly what happens here. He's late with his hands here. Um, he doesn't. So if we play it. You can see he doesn't get that initial punch um, like we saw on all of his good reps. And every single one of his good reps, he got that that initial punch um, into the chest um, of the defender and was able to control the point of attack. He obviously does not do that here, um, and his hands are, are still down by his side. If you look at the center, um, the other guys, they have their hands a little bit higher. But you can see um, he, he is, he's late. He tries to get that punch a little bit late. The defender is able to just swat his hands away, and he just doesn't have that power in his lower half uh, to push the guy away. He tries to use his length, but that doesn't always work. Um, this doesn't have that drive in, the, in the, his lower body uh, to kind of uh, overpower that defender, and instead... Um, gives up a sack there. Um, so that's going to happen from time to time. I notice this happens usually later in the game, uh, so it might be a conditioning issue. If he gets a little tired, might be not be on top of his game, um, um, and, and is just tends to be a little bit later with his hands. And as I said, he needs to win early in the rep um, if he wants to, to really control the point of attack. Um, so that's something he might be able to work on. We know the coach, I, at training camp, the coaches were preaching conditioning. They were running in between drills, they weren't jogging like they have been in year past. years past. There's not a lot of time in between drills, so I think conditioning is going to be a big thing for them. So maybe that's something he can get better at um, as the year goes on. But again, um, when you're talking to a guy who was drafted all the way back in 2014, 
kind of a he is who he is situation here. So I'm not sure if he can get much better there, uh, but it's something to keep an eye on. The other way he loses um, is just with power. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I showed you his athletic profile. Uh, he wins with quickness. He wins with technique. Uh, but he can be overpowered by defenders, especially when he's matched up one-on-one -on -one with a defensive tackle, which is the case here. So he's lined up with a defensive tackle who's lined up as a two, uh, just a straight two technique, um, which is you don't, which you don't see very often. So he's lined up right over the face of, of Schofield, and he doesn't have any help from his center. Um, no double teams here. Um, and you can see he'll just get overpowered. He does still show that good wide base, um, so he, which usually helps you anchor against bull rushes. Um, um, so it does help him not get completely blown off the ball, but he does get eventually pushed back into the quarterback um, and gives up the sack. Um, so again, um, that's not something he's probably going to be improved on. He just does not have the strength in his lower body. Maybe he can play a little bit lower, a uh, little play with a little bit better leverage. That might help him. Uh, but really, he just needs uh, he needs to get that that uh, he even gets a little a, a pretty good punch on there too. Uh, he just doesn't have the power to go up against those big uh, nose tackles. Uh, consistently and win those blocks one on one. You might be in a situation where you need to slide the protection over. Um, if he is in a situation like that again, get that double team from the center. Um, in this case, the center goes the other way <clears throat> to pick up a stunt. Uh, maybe get a chip from a running back. Uh, but if he does get matched up with a with a nose tackle one on one, he's most likely going to lose that rep. <laughs> um, here we have uh, the run blocking, as I mentioned. Um, you know, the, the Chargers ran mostly gap power um, in their run scheme. Bears are going to run mostly outside zone. Uh, but as, again, as I mentioned, no matter how, what your scheme is, you're going to have to run outside zone, you're going to have to run inside zone, you're going to run run gap power. Um, it's just a matter of how often you run each one. Um, so this is an example of the Chargers just running a power scheme, and you can see the deficiencies in his game here. It's one of the reasons why his uh, run blocking PFF grade was so low. Um, it's because um, they ran a lot of these gap power, which is not does not fit his strength. He's better when he's on the move, moving laterally um, in the outside zone scheme. Uh, but this is what they ran most of the time. And you can see he just doesn't again doesn't have the power in his lower body. Um, he engages, gets a good um, kind of stance well, engages, uh, but just loses the point of attack. The defensive lineman is able to stack and shed him. Um, you can see it even a little bit better from the other angle. Um, just doesn't have that power in the run game to move guys off their spot, um, and especially you know in that power scheme, it just wasn't a good fit for him. So um, again, that's that's going to be an issue when the Bears are in you know short area situation or goal line where you run where they might be running a little bit more power scheme. Um, but it's not a coincidence that Schofield's best run blocking in years came when he his first two years in the league when he was in with Denver who ran a lot more outside zone, a lot of inside zone too. Um, so it's not a coincidence that those were his two best run blocking years. Uh, when he moved to the Chargers, he, he kept up his pass blocking proficiency, but his run blocking um, skills went you know went down. And it's because it wasn't a great fit for this game. So hopefully, um, with the Bears, he could be a little bit better on that run blocking side, and hopefully he can just kind of stay where he is as a pass blocker because you can take you take that um, um, you know a ninety seven point seven pass blocker proficiency, fourteenth in, in the NFL. That's that's pretty good. You'll take that um, from a guy you signed late in the off season. So. Um, again, overall, I really like the Marcus Goldfield signing. I think uh, he's, it's perfect. It allows you to be a little bit more patient with your young guys. Jatai Ricardo does not have to start week one, which is a huge jump in competition for him. Um, and he's a guy that I really like. He was my favorite offensive lineman that they drafted outside of Braxton Jones, so favorite like late-round offensive lineman. Um, so I, I'm really excited about him, but I just like him better um, with more time uh, to get acclimated to the NFL, and, and Scopio allows him to do that. He's a really good stopgap for them. Um, could even potentially be signed to an extension down the road uh, if he performs well this year. Um, but overall, sophomore good from bad from Scopio. I'm excited to see him um, see him uh, start week one for the Bears. All right, next up we are moving on to Riley Reef. Uh, so the offensive tackle they signed. Um, just at first glance, uh, I like the signing just because we didn't have any veteran presence on the for either offensive tackle spot uh, before Riley Reef. It was looking like it was going to be Braxton Jones. Tevin Jenkins, and Larry Borum I'm finding out uh, for position units, that's obviously a rookie and two second-year players. Don't love that from your offensive tackle. So just bringing in a guy with 147 career games, 139 starts, is a win in my book. Um, you need to have those veteran presence, especially on the offensive line. 
guys who can um, uh, make it so you can develop your the, your uh, rookies and young guys behind him. Um, maybe a guy who's not a, a game changer, but is going to be able to be a good stopgap uh, for a play down the road. So again, he's an older guy. Back, He's driving the first round all the way back in 2012. He's 33 years old currently. He's going to be turning 34 during the year. Um, so... Um, so it, you're not really sure what you're going to get with a guy like this who, who signed this late in the offseason who's, um, you know, heading towards the end of his career, uh, if not there already. Um, so, But it's been an interesting couple of years for Riley Reef. Um, if we look at his stats, you'll see that he performed a lot better in 2020 than he did in 2021. Um, so he had a higher pass block grade, gave up fewer sacks, um, fewer hurries, the same amount of pressures in uh, more pass blocking opportunities. Um, in 2020, so he had a better pass blocking efficiency, better pressure rate, and better pressure rate in true, pre- uh, true pass sets, which again is pass sets that um, you don't have any help, no double teams, no chips, um, and the uh, the uh, time to throw is greater than, I believe, it's two seconds. Um, so 5.9% in uh, 2020 is pretty good, 8.3 in 2021 is uh, obviously not as good. Um, so what I tried to do with Riley Reef is, is determine... You know, is that an issue of him just having an off year? Is it an issue of him, um, you know, on the decline? Trying to figure that out. Um, obviously, the big difference between 2020 and 2021 is he changed positions. So he played left tackle for the Vikings in 2020. When he signed with the Bengals last year, um, they moved him to right tackle. Um, so it just flipped him on the other side of the ball. Um, and he obviously did not play as well. Um, so is it an issue of him declining or is it an issue of him uh, playing a different position? I believe it was um, Jeff Schwartz who de- um, described changing, uh, flipping sides of the of the offensive line uh, um, as uh, trying to wipe your ass with your opposite hand. Um, it just it's something you can do, but it's very difficult and just feels awkward, um, which I think is a great analogy. Um, so it's obviously a very tough thing for a guy who played left tackle his entire career to all of a sudden in year not uh, ten or nine or ten, whatever it was, uh, to start playing the opposite side of the ball. So. Um, I tried to kind of get to the bottom of to see um, if that was the cause of his of his doubt of his uh, decreased play, or if it was you know, um, or if it's because he's you know just getting older and maybe at the end of his career. Um, so that's what I tried to get to the bottom to of. Right. So to do this, I'm going to show a play from 2020 with him lined up at the left tackle, and then a combo will play of him lined up at right tackle in 2021 and kind of compare the two. So we're going to start with this play um, in 2020. Again, at left tackle. Um, so this is a really good pass set from him. Um, a little bit clunky, but he does near the, the defender's uh, forward pretty well. So this is a true pass set that I was talking about before. No help, um, more time to throw than two seconds, uh, no chips from a running back, nothing like that. Um, so you can see he mirrors the footwork of the offensive lineman very well, and he stays square the entire time. So he's always constantly uh, in between the defender and the quarterback. Um, I like his... Um, base to be a little bit wider, that's kind of nitpicking, but you can see how he's mirroring the footwork, and he's square right now to the defender, and to the, and his back is square to the quarterback. Um, and then you can see he has a um, little late on his bunch, but he um, good, really good hand placement here, so it might be hard to tell, but his left arm is, the target there is the outside chest plate of the, um, of the defender, so the left arm, left hand is on the, the left um, chest plate of the defender, right arm, the um, the target there is the uh, inside bicep, so the left bicep, and then you'll see his arm will then move up to the shoulder pad of the um, of the defender, and then he gets um, his hand. That's his way of getting his hands underneath the chest, uh, the um, the shoulder pads, and a good way to control the point of attack there. Um, so really good pass re- pass set from him. We'll just watch it in full without pausing it. Um, so he does a really good job there of controlling the point of attack and not allowing, not allowing his guy to get um, to the quarterback. So then um, we'll look at the difference here at right tackle. So you can see his pass set is, again, just a little bit clunky, but he also oversets a lot. Um, so you can see instead of um, staying square to the defender, you can see he goes a little bit too far and opens up that, that hip. So you can see that, 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 right, um, that right foot which pulls that back a little bit, which uh, makes him susceptible, uh, susceptible to the inside move here by J. Davian Clowney. Um, recovers a little bit, but then 
Todd is up, uh, off balance enough where he can't do anything there. And uh, Kalani doesn't get the sack, but you can see the, the footwork, uh, the, the stained square, the mirroring of the feet of the defender is not the same from that right tackle position as it was from the left tackle position. Isn't able to get his hands in a, in a place um, because he, because of that overset. And yeah, it all starts with that oversetting of his stance. Um, and right there, that step um, to the back which opens up that inside move for, for Jadavian Colony. It all starts there um, and is a main difference um, from his uh, pretty good um, season in 2021 or 2020 to his poor season in 2021. So that oversetting issue, that's a, a, a common thing when you watch Riley Reef. Um, it showed up a lot more in 2021 uh, at right tackle, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen in 2020 as well. He was also doing it um, when he was on the left side as well. So it's just something that, you know, it was probably natural for him. And then when he was moved away from his natural position, um, it kind of just came out uh, more often um, on the right-hand side. Uh, but now let's look at how he handled speed um, uh, the, the, in 2020 and 2021. So this first rep is against the, um, the Seahawks. So he's going up against Shaq Griffin here, who really the only way he's going to beat you is with speed. Um, so you can see, well, that the, this first half play out, but you can see it better from the second angle. But you can see how, how he does, um, even though he's going up against a speed rusher, um, he's not too concerned about getting beat to the edge because he stays square the entire time. And only once the defender commits to going to the outside does he then open up his hips and, and push the guy away, uh, Shaq Griffin away. So let's watch that again. You can see it a little bit better from the other angle. He doesn't commit to anything until the defender commits to the outside. Then he opens up his hips. Whereas um, on the other play, he's opening up his hips before the defender made a move because he was wor so worried about getting beat to the outside. Um, so that was in 2020. Got an example from 2021. So this is, you know, against the Bears, as you can see. So it's, and it's obviously against Khalil Mack, who's a little bit better pass rusher than Shaq Griffin. Um, but the way Mac is lined up, wide nine technique, way outside the tight end, and you have a tight end to your inside, um, you know that he's the only way this player, uh, Khalil Mack, or anyone really, is going to be able to be you is to the outside because you have that tight end there. Um, he'd have to cross his face to, to get to your inside. Um, he's going outside the entire way. This should be a, a relatively easy block um, for, for Riley Reef, but as you can see, it's not. Um, no real harm done because it's a quicker pass, uh, but you can see how, how he opens up that hip, um, which in this case usually wouldn't be a bad thing because you know he's got to beat you to the outside. Um, but even still, even with all that, even knowing he's going to be trying to beat you to speed, even with opening up his hips early, he's still not able to avoid his quarterback from getting hit. Um, so that seems to me more of a guy who isn't able to shuffle um, laterally as well as he used to. Um, a guy who, that's that seems to be more of an age thing rather than a side of the ball thing. Um, because that should have been an easy block. There should have been no way that, I don't care how good a uh, pass rusher Clue Mack is, that could have been TJ Watt or anyone. Um, there's no way they could, should have got a QB hit there based on how they were aligned um, and, and how quick that pass was going to get out. Um, he needed to shuffle his feet a little bit better and get in front of that, um, in front of him and, and prevent that his quarterback from getting hit there. Uh, so now we're going to look at his ability to anchor against a bull rush. Um, so let's start again on the left side. So this is in 2020. You can see um, he does a good, good job anchoring there. Get some good job anchoring despite the defender getting his hands into his face and getting called for a penalty there. Um, but we can see that again. And he's able to do this not because he has great, you know, lower body strength. Or, or superior with low body strength or anything, but he does it because he's able to stay square the entire time with the rusher um, and is able to take him on. He gets pushed back a little bit, but eventually is able to anchor and stop that bull rush from getting to the quarterback. Um, if we look at 2021, now again, this is also against Khalil Mack. Um, he had a rough game against Khalil Mack, and this is also a notice for anyone who said that Khalil Mack um, took a step back last year and isn't good anymore. Um, that is not true. Khalil Mack, uh, when healthy, is still one of the best pass rushers in football. Uh, but, again, so this is a tough tough matchup, so it's hard to blame Riley Reef for getting bull rushed by Khalil Mack. A lot of great tackles would get bull rushed by Khalil Mack. But you can see the difference in the pass set uh, that caused him 
to not be able to anchor like he did on the last play. And again, it comes from oversetting and over opening up that outside hip, um, which just throws off uh, his balance. So there you can see that last step there with his right foot um, stepping and opening up his his hip, which allows him, which makes him very susceptible to inside moves or bull rushes. Um, and once Khalil Mack decides to bull rush him, uh, it's over. He gets pushed back to the quarterback. Khalil Mack doesn't get the sack, uh, but does cause that sack, um, and it gets the sack for someone else. Um, so that that most of his issues come from just um, that oversetting, um, that that fear of getting beat around to the outside, and that comes from you know maybe being a little bit older. He was never a super athletic guy. Uh, I don't have his RAS score, but if you looked at it, it was very average, um, and that was back in 2012. So 10 years later, we're looking at now. Um, he's a guy. Who, I think he's worried about getting beat to the outside because he doesn't have the foot speed to to get to those speed rushers anymore. So he has to cheat a little bit, and players have started to take advantage of that uh, by beating him to the inside uh, or bull rushing, like like you just saw there. Um, so it's something that, you know, he, again, he is a, he's 34 years old. He is what he is right now. And he, uh, he's not going to get any quicker. Um, his feet aren't going to get faster as he gets older. Um, so it's something, you know, he's going to have to to learn how to, to, to maybe uh, compensate in other ways. There are plenty of offensive linemen who, Lose a step or two, uh, but still played to, into the late thirties. Maybe watch some Jason Peters tape. See, see how he did it. Andrew Whitworth, guys who had really long careers, who maybe weren't the most athletic guys, or maybe they were athletic when they were younger, but obviously lost a step as they got older. Um, so maybe he has to win more of technique um, rather than quickness, um, which it doesn't seem that he's able to do anymore. So Reef can work on oversetting um, and opening up that hip, keeping square on on his defensive on the defensive lineman. Uh, one thing he can't really improve upon um, is he does have short arms for a tackle. We were just talking about Michael Schofield. He has 34-inch arms. Riley Reef has 33-inch arms. Uh, so usually you want your length on the outside on your tackles, um, and your opposite guards and centers can have you know short arms and maybe get by. But Riley Reef doesn't have the longest of arms, and it shows up um, no matter what side of uh, the formation he's playing on. So here he is on the left left side against the Vikings in, in his good year in 2020. You can see how the defender gets his his arms on the chest and the shoulder pads of Reef before Reef can get his hands on him. Um, and because of that, he's able to control the point of attack and get around him for a QB hit there. Um, same thing Hap showed up when he was at right tackle. So again, this is not a, this is for sure not a side of the football thing. This is just a, a player weakness that he has that he's not going to be able to get better at. Um, so we have two angles here. You can see it better from the second angle. Um, so we'll let it go to the second one. Um, so you can see... Uh, the defender gets, again, um, his hands into the chest um, of Riley Reef, and because of that, he's able to control it and shed the block um, for a sack. So that's something that's going to, you know, that's going to happen uh, no matter what side of the ball he's playing on, whether he's playing at his natural position of left tackle or if he's playing at his less experienced position of right tackle, his short arms do show up um, on tape from time to time. One of the ways he gets around his short arms is he does, he is usually pretty good with his hands, um, he's very patient. Um, usually he's not a first striker. He's usually a guy who's going to uh, be reactive to the, the uh, defender's moves. And this is an example of um, a guy where he, uh, a rep where he waits for the offensive lineman to try to use that long arm technique to get into his shoulder pads, knowing that he doesn't have the longest arms. Uh, but he um, shows good technique to be patient. And once he extends his arm like that, um, he's able to use his hands to kind of cross chop him down, get his hands off him and pancake him uh, for a really good rep uh, pass blocking. So even with those uh, short arms, it's not a death sentence to Riley Reef. There are plenty of guys who have short arms. Obviously, Reef himself has been in the league for 10 years. Uh, plenty of guys with short arms at offensive tackle. One of the best to ever do it, Joe Thomas, didn't have the longest arms. Um, and obviously, he's he had put together a Hall of Fame career. So I'm um, not saying Riley Reef is Joe Thomas, but uh, there are ways around that and ways to, to kind of hide that um, to still get to get by when, when you're going up against these defensive linemen who might have 34, 35-inch arms. All right, so run blocking. I'll say um, with Reef when watching him, there wasn't a whole lot of difference between him run blocking when he was on the left side and when he was run blocking on the right side. Um, so I'm not going to approach this the same way uh, because I think he is a, overall, regardless of what size he, side he was on, a, a pretty decent run blocker at least. Um, also, he's coming from schemes with both the Bengals and the um, and the Vikings, who who ran more outside zone than what the Chargers did uh, with Michael Schofield. So he's a little bit more familiar 
um, especially with the Bengals uh, running that outside zone. Um, and, then, and then, like I said, you, you, no matter what scheme you're running, I want to just handle on that point. You're going to be running outside zone, inside zone power uh, from, time to, from time to time. But I have some outside zone runs here to show you, um, to just show you kind of how, how, he, um, how he operates and what he does well. Um, let me share the screen. Um, so here I have a play here. This is going to be, um, the first couple plays here are going to be play side. Um, so the ball is going um, towards his direction. So we're looking at the, obviously the left tackle here. Um, so on this particular play, um, the t tight end here is going to be blocking this uh, linebacker on the edge, blocking him out of the play. And then Riley Reeves' responsibility is going to be targeting the inside shoulder of this defensive end and knocking him out of the play. And he does a good job here. Uh, then the center and uh, left guard are going to do a combo block on this guy uh, before their left guard gets up to the second level. Um, but we're just going to be focusing on on Reef. So watch um, how he targets that inside shoulder of this defensive end and uses really good uh, rotational strength to kind of push him out of the play. So you can see um, where he squares up there, and then he's able to turn his body um, just using his upper body strength to kind of create a hole for the running back. Um, and as you can see, there's a big hole there. Um, now the defensive end here does... Um, end up actually making the tackle here, but he, the opening up of that initial running lane is is a really nice uh, rep from um, from Riley Reeve, but maybe something that you know he's not perfect about because he could have drove him out a little bit farther um, and prevented him and prevented him from coming back and making that play, uh, which would have resulted in met, uh, more yards. But still a nice rep from from Reef to kind of use that again that rotational strength to open up that hole and get that big body defensive end out of of the running lane. This next one is also going to be a play side block. Um, so again, they're going to be running behind Riley Reef here. Uh, but his responsibility is different, which is why I, I pointed this out. Um, so you have the tight end here who's going to be blocking the inside shoulder um, of this defensive end, knocking him out of the play. And then instead of the center and guard um, going up to the second level, combo blocking going up to the second level, it's going to be the tackle on the guard here. Um, so Reef is going to start blocking this, this three technique, um, allow number 78 to get to his outside shoulder before moving on to the second level. I could be wrong. I think number 78 is uh, current bear Dakota Dozier, who's on IR right now. Uh, could be wrong about that. But we're just going to be focusing on Reef. So he's going to, again, uh, kind of chip this defensive, uh, this defensive tackle and then move to the second level. Um, and he does a good job of, of getting to the second level and, and, and blocking his guy there, too. So again, shoulder to the chest, um, stays square, keeps his arm out in case this in case this guy chooses. I don't know my this guy chooses to, to blitz there, uh, but then is able to get to the second level on Devin White, who's a very athletic linebacker. Um, who's a very uh, Devin White is a very athletic linebacker uh, to create a, a hole for the running back um, and a pretty decent uh, gain there. So then now he so that was those two were both uh, play side outside uh, outside zones, but him blocking to the play side. This is an outside zone, him blocking on the back side. So the run play, the run direction is is to the right here. Um, so with Reef, he doesn't have anyone over him to block. They're going to leave this defensive end unblocked, and what Reef is going to do is just going to get right to the second level, and his uh, target here is um, is Bobby Wagner. So. Um, this is back in 2020, so, you know, at this point, Wagner is not the same player he used to be, but he's still a very good linebacker who's very smart um, and understands angles and everything like that. So, um, but Reef does a very good job getting that second level and at least uh, getting a couple good blocks on, on Bobby Wagner and not allowing him, him to, to get sideline to sideline and make a play. Um, so here we have Reef over here on the left side. So you can see he's going to leave that, that defensive end unblocked get to the second level, and make a couple of nice blocks there. Um, so that's back in 2020. Again, there wasn't a huge difference between what I saw um, in his 2020 tape to his 2021 tape. The only thing that I would say that maybe he didn't do as well in 2021 is, is blocking on the backside um, of an outside zone. So you saw a good example there. We'll get to maybe a, a worse example a little later on. But this is, still, is also going to be a play side um, 
box. So we'll let this go from this angle, and then we'll take a look at it um, again from the second angle. So the, the cornerback there makes a nice play to blow that play from the backfield. Um, but Riley Reef does a good job here. So this is going to be, an ex again, a play side run, um, outside zone. So first step for everyone is going to be to the outside here. And the right guard and right tackle, Reef, are going to be the uh, guys working together here. Uh, so Reef is going to then block on this, uh, looks like a 4 eye technique uh, defensive tackle, allow the right guard to overtake him, and then he's going to get to the second level and block this corner back there. Uh, now this guy here is going to undercut everything and, and blow up the play in the backfield, but that's certainly not Riley Reef's fault. He uh, does his job, so we're just going to focus on him. So again, gets he doesn't quite get his, his shoulder into the guy like he did on the last play, but he still is able to. Um, so I'd like to see him actually kind of spend a little bit more time making sure that that defensive um, tackle can, or the, the right guard can get to the outside shoulder of that uh, defensive tackle. But you can see he does get, um, it does allow him to get to the second level and get to that cornerback um, and block basically two guys on that play. Now, I figure what this one is. Okay, so this is a backside example. Oops. Um, so again, if there is one area where he may he maybe has you know fallen off a little bit because of either switching positions or uh, you know got a little bit older, it's these backside blocks. Um, so he needs to. So he's over here. He needs to get to the inside shoulder of this four eye technique. Now I think this right guard doesn't do a great job of helping him out. So what they're supposed to be doing these two guys together is blocking this guy, and then once they have the right tackle gets to the inside shoulder, uh, the right guard can then get to the, the second level um, and block um, block the linebacker. Um, but still, um, he does get at least a little bit of a hand on him, but you can see he's just not able to flip his hips. His hips. So when I was talking about Michael Schofield earlier on these plays, he's able to flip his hips and create a seal and get in between the ball the ball and the... And the um, get in between the ball carrier and the defender. Um, and Reef just isn't able to do that as successfully. He just doesn't have the, the fluid hips to flip them um, and get in between the ball carrier. If he did, this could possibly have gone for a bigger gain, but um, the uh, defensive tackle, I believe it's Dalton Tomlinson, is able to push him and actually basically make the tackle on that play. Um, so not a terrible rep, but definitely could have been better. If he, um, and that just seems like it's you know he might have just lost a step a little bit. Um, same thing kind of happens on this play too. As I mentioned, this, these backside blocks he's not as good at. This is a very tough block though in his defense. Um, so he's here. He needs to get to the inside shoulder of Akeem Hicks. Um, and as we know, Akeem Hicks, even last year when healthy, is one of the best run defending defensive tackles in the game. Um, and he was healthy in this game, and he, him and Khalil Mack actually very much dominated this game. Um, but uh, he's not able to, again, flip his hips and get to the outside shoulder, inside shoulder of Akeem Hicks. This right guard here, again, does not give him a lot of help. This is a very difficult block. Uh, but this is something that showed up a couple different times, even if he, when he did have a little bit of help. He actually gets very like, almost no help here. Uh, but you can see he just is really struggling um, to flip his hips and get in between the defender and the ball carrier. He just doesn't have that fluidity anymore, that athleticism, um, to allow him to do that. All right, so overall impressions of Reef, um, I think he's very much an average offensive tackle. Uh, one thing, when I started putting all this stuff together, I was under the impression that Reef would be playing left tackle for the Bears, which I think is his best position, based on what I've seen from watching this past two years of, of his play. Uh, but now with Braxton Jones getting all the starting reps at, at left tackle, and uh, Riley Reef splitting reps with Larry Buong at right tackle, I'm thinking that the Bears disagree and that they're going to start Braxton Jones at left tackle and that and probably Riley Reef will start at right tackle um, with Larry Borm coming, coming in if one of them gets injured. My guess is if if Jones gets injured, Reef would move over to left tackle and uh, Larry Borm would play right tackle. And then if Reef gets injured, then Borm will just come in at right tackle. That's kind of my guess on how that plays out. Um, so for me, it, it's... It, it kind of dampers my enthusiasm about Riley Reef a little bit because when you look at his stats at right tackle, and not just his stats, but his tape at right tackle, 
um, it's not as good as left tackle. You know, that 58.4 uh, pass blocking grade, that's 69th of, uh, amongst right tackle, against all tackles last year. Um, 96.8 pass blocking efficiency, 38, uh, four sacks allowed, 41st. That's really not that good. That's a, a, a well below average offensive tackle. I think he could be an average left tackle. Uh, but knowing that, it does, like I said, damper my enthusiasm a little bit. But it's always nice to have veterans on the offensive line, a guy who can really help out Braxton Jones. Um, I'm not going to bemoan the signing at all. Even if he does play a right tackle, I don't care how much money they gave him. Uh, there's a plenty of cap space to make it work. I um, mean, they also didn't give him really that much either. Um, but uh, uh, but anyway, yeah, it's just always nice to have a good, good, uh, a solid veteran on there to, to kind of help out the young guys. Um, if I uh, kind of overall talking about Reef and Schofield, if I'm excited about one guy more, it's it's definitely Michael Schofield. I think he's a better pass blocking offensive lineman, um, which is just a more valuable skill set, uh, to be honest. And also, he's more at a position in need. Uh, if the Bears, you know, did have to start right, um, Barry Borum at right tackle over Riley Reef. You know, that's not a huge job off, I don't think. Uh, whereas Schofield to a rookie uh, is, could be a potentially huge drop off. So I think right guard is a little bit, bit bigger position of need. So I'm a little more excited about him. I think he's an overall better player as well, even though he was signed to a smaller contract. Um, but I think both guys, again, bring that veteran leadership to a, to a team. Um, good stop, stop gaps, probably nothing more. Schofield maybe gets a second contract with the Bears. I'd be surprised if Reef does, especially if they like Braxton Jones as much as they think they do. Um, so if Jones does play pretty well. Um, I don't. I don't think there's really a chance Reef gets that second contract. Uh, but a good stopgap maybe allows them to draft a, or sign another uh, offensive tackle next off season. Uh, but overall, um, I think you got maybe one one for sure average offensive lineman, one maybe below average offensive lineman. Um, but we're considering where the Bears are at. Um, I'll take that any of the week. And also, you just get more depth along the offensive line. Um, you always need depth um, when it comes, especially on the offensive line. You're gonna have injuries, um, and you can't be taking guys off the street um, expecting to plug in and, and play. Now they have eight, nine, ten guys who have been in the um, who are gonna go through training camp, go through the preseason, um, go through practices each week. Uh, so if they do have an injury, they can kind of you know at least you know. Put some glue on it and, and hope it works instead of just grabbing a guy off the streets uh, who's never played and then trying to plug him in. Um, so overall, both good signings. We'll see how they play out. I'm excited to, for the season to start so I can stop speculating and just start doing more um, analysis. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. My throat is extremely sore from talking this much, so I'm gonna shut up now. Um, I'm expect again, like I said, I'm gonna probably I'm gonna try to do another podcast this weekend. Uh, I think it's going to be on Justin Fields, um, which I got know is a little bit late with the season starting, but I want to do kind of a recap of his last season and where uh, where he looked good, and but most importantly, where he can improve upon, because I think there's been a lot of uh, people, including myself, sharing videos of him looking amazing, um, and not so many people talking about where he needs to improve, um, and every player needs to improve. Um, so I want to do something like that, hopefully, um, this weekend, maybe come out Monday or Tuesday next week before the first preseason game. Um, and then after that, I can just start uh, <clears throat> talking about the actual games itself. So, um, share, like, share, comment, subscribe. I really appreciate everyone's support. Thank you everyone for the kind words. When I mentioned I had COVID, that was really nice. Not expecting that at all. Um, so that was really uh, great to see. Um, so thank you everyone for that. And uh, hopefully I see some people at Bears Camp on the 20th. Um, and if not, uh, if I don't see you, bear down. <laughs>